Hello all and welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to APIs in data analytics. My name is Michal Weibar and I'm a principal product manager at Good Data. I'm going to walk you through this webinar together with Tomasz Gabik, who is a senior sales engineer at Good Data. For those who are not familiar with Good Data, our company delivers embedded analytics at scale, helping more than 140,000 companies to achieve their analytics goals and ultimately grow their businesses. Before we start, let me briefly go over some webinar logistics. All attendees are muted upon entry. If you have any questions, feel free to use the Zoom Q&A box, and my colleagues will answer them for you right away. And lastly, a follow-up email with the webinar recording will be sent to all participants. So you can return to any of the topics discussed or share the webinar with a colleague. Today, we will focus on APIs in data analytics. After a brief introduction to the APIs, we will explain what an API-first approach is. We will show its benefits with practical examples. We will also mention what the next steps may be and what tools are worth to explore. Well, let's start. API, or Application Programming Interface, is a term that you may have come across in discussions about technology and software development. While APIs are often seen as technical jargon, they play a crucial role in shaping the digital landscape and can significantly impact businesses. In simple terms, APIs enable different software systems to communicate and interact with each other, creating opportunities for innovation efficiency, and growth. To understand APIs, let's think about a real-life example. Imagine you are at a restaurant and you want to order lunch. You select some meal and beverage from the menu, communicate your order to the waiter, who then takes it to the kitchen. In this scenario, the waiter acts as an intermediary or interface between you and the kitchen staff, helping you place your order and delivering the food back to you. Similarly, in the digital realm, APIs act as interfaces between different software applications, enabling them to talk to each other and exchange information. They define a set of rules and protocols that determine how different systems can interact and what kind of data or operations they can access. As we demonstrated in the example with the waiter, the communication is done in two steps. A request was asked, the food was ordered, and a response was received. The food was prepared and delivered from the kitchen. Let's take a look on these two steps in the context of the computer world. The request is made by a client to server hosting the API. The client can be an application, a user browser, or any other system. The request consists of three important components, address, authentication, and request description. The address refers to specific location or URL where an API can be accessed. It is like a unique identifier that allows you to send requests to the desired API endpoint. The address typically includes the domain name or API address of the server hosting the API along with any additional paths or parameters required to specify the resource or action. Authentication is the process of verifying 
the identity and permissions of the user or application making the API request. It ensures that only authorized individuals or systems can access and interact with the API. Authentication mechanisms can include API keys, tokens, usernames, passwords, or other security measures to protect the API and its resources. The request description contains the necessary information sent to the API in order to perform a specific action or a retrieve specific data. It includes details about what should be done and can contain any additional data or parameters if they are needed by the API to process the request. The response is the server's answer to the client's request. It provides the result of the requested action and the data that the client requested. The response also includes information whether the request was successful or encountered any issues. The numerical status code is typically used to determine the success or failure of the request, so the client can know whether the error is on the server side or anywhere else. The response details include the data or information sent back by the API to client. This can vary depending on the API and the specific request made. The response may include some data, for example, files or web page. Or in case of failure, the response may contain error message or other relevant information based on the API's design and purpose. APIs can be used at a different levels to facilitate communication and data exchange between various components, applications, or services. Internal APIs do this within a single application or system. These APIs enable the module architecture of the system, allowing components to interact and share data seamlessly. For example, in a BI analytics platform, internal APIs can be used between data ingestion services, data transformation services, visualization modules, or reporting components. They promote flexibility, scalability, and loose coupling within the application. External APIs enable integration between a BI analytics platform and external systems, services, or data sources. These APIs allow the platform to access functionalities or retrieve data from third-party applications or services. For instance, a BI platform may integrate with external APIs of social media platforms, marketing tools, or cloud storage services to get the data for analytics. The external APIs expand the capabilities of the BI platform by leveraging external resources and fostering interoperability with other systems. In the recent years, a new approach called API First has gained popularity among businesses and technology experts. In traditional development, applications are built as standalone entities and APIs are created later on. This approach often leads to integration challenges and limits the flexibility and scalability of the applications. Building products in an API-first way means designing and developing the underlying API infrastructure as the primary foundation with the intention of enabling seamless integration and collaboration between different applications and services. API-first approach focuses on creating a well-defined API specification that outlines how different components and systems will interact. This specification acts 
as a contract or blueprint for building the rest of the application. In good data, we decided to follow the API-first approach in our development process, so our products and our customers can profit from that. There are plenty of benefits from the API-first approach. By designing the API-first, you ensure that the different applications and systems can communicate seamlessly. This reduces integration challenges and allows for a smooth data exchange, enabling you to create a whole ecosystem of interconnected software components. It's like having a common language that everyone understands, so information can smoothly flow between any applications. Building API first promotes a modular approach to development. Each component can be developed independently based on the API contract. This modularity allows teams to work in parallel, making the development process more efficient and reducing dependencies between different parts of the system. APIs designed upfront are flexible and adaptable. They can be reused and extended to accommodate future exchanges and requirements. This future-proofing capability saves development time and resources by allowing you to build upon existing APIs rather than starting from scratch when new functionalities or integrations are needed. Adopting an API-first approach encourages collaboration among developers and teams. Since the API serves as well-defined contract, different teams can work concurrently on different parts of the application. This parallel development supports innovation, as teams can experiment and iterate independently while adhering to the API guidelines. APIs provide a basis for implementing scalable and agile architectures, such as microservices. With an API-first approach, you can design and develop APIs that support the decomposition of your application into smaller, manageable services. These services can be independently deployed, scaled, and updated enabling your system to handle increased traffic and evolving business needs. APIs enable seamless integration with third-party applications and services. By exposing your API to external developers, you can create an ecosystem around your product or platform. This allows third-party developers to build on top of your APIs, expanding the functionality and possibilities of your application while reaching a broader audience. Let me now hand over the word to Tomáš, who will tell you more about how you can profit from the API-first approach. Thank you, Michele, for the lovely introduction. I'm Thomas Gabik, a senior sales engineer here in Good Data, and I'll be uh, swiftly continuing with the practical examples of how API-first approach can be used in Good Data. Uh, before, we do it, before we do that, I just wanted to quickly uh, give you some more uh, examples where the API-first approach might actually be handy and why. We know that uh, the API-first approach is going to be much more flexible than relying purely on the proprietary tooling that other tools or even good data can offer. So giving the flexibility to the hands of the developer is actually something that we aspire to do. The developer friendliness is again, something that we would like to offer. That means that your developer team is likely going to be really happy with using APIs, using other tools at our disposal, which will go into, which are going to seamlessly um, stick into um, the, the tool stack that your engineering team is using. APIs are fast. 
meaning that uh, there, there is a way to programmatically automate and make changes to the product, make changes to the analytics in real time. They are also secure and governable. And of course, you can automate all the APIs in a way that fits you and so that you see the changes and make the changes in your product that you're actually uh, desiring. A few practical examples of how API first approach works here in Good Data. Before I go through that, I just want to briefly introduce the concept of analytics as a code. Uh, that means that basically everything that can be done within the Good Data UI can actually be stored, versioned, exported in a code format. Again, that is a massive component that is going to be tightly linked to the API first approach and some of the pieces of the demonstration that I'm going to be showing. The scalability, meaning provisioning of dedicated environments, provisioning of new users to the analytics, provisioning um, uh, provisioning new analytical de developments, uh, new analytical components to the environments, all of that is seamless, fast, and scalable. There is a massive level of customization that good data offers out of the box. Of course, with that being said, uh, using the API first approach, using other tools at our disposal, like Python SDK and React SDK, the potential for the customization is pretty much limitless. To kind of capitalize on the scalability uh, and the workspace and user provisioning, I just have a brief example of how we usually tend to think about multi-tenancy and what it means in the analytics. Uh, I'm going to be showing you the live demonstration of how that works, uh, including the API calls. So let's go to the demonstration. All right, uh, what you see in front of yourself is an application which deals with the APIs where you can post the, uh, the API commands basically. So uh, think of it as an environment where you're going to be communicating with the, uh, within which you're going to be communicating with the uh, waiter that, um, that uh, Michal was using in his example. So in my specific scenario, I have a couple of API calls that I'm going to be using uh, to give you a, an idea of how those APIs are used uh, within Good Data's environment. To show you a little bit of the Good Data's environment as well, uh, let me go back there. So this is a Good Data Cloud instance currently containing two workspaces uh, that contain some data. And we're going to be looking at the ways to alternate the environment using the APIs. So right out of the get-go, the first command that we're going to use is uh, the one that's going to give us a metric definition. So think of it as gaining a menu access in that restaurant. So using this API call, uh, I should get the list of a specific metric or potentially a lot of metrics or other analytical objects that are stored in the analytical environment uh, that I'm working on. This one is giving me uh, some JSON definition of uh, a specific metric that I can then reuse, store, or alternate even within the code. That would be a first example of how the APIs can actually be utilized. Additional ones are going to be working with the concept of workspace hierarchy. So like I said, uh, when explaining, like I explained when I was talking about the workspace hierarchy and the multi-tenancy, uh, there is a concept of basically uh, utilizing some sort of relationship between a parent and a child workspace, meaning that if you want to work with a multi-tenant environment and providing analytics to multiple clients, you can basically work within just like one environment and all of the other ones are going to be automatically updated. So to apply the workspace hierarchy, again, we're going to be relying on good data's APIs. I'm going to call one to create a new workspace that gave me a message of 201. Again, Michal really rightly explained that uh, APIs are basically going to indicate whether the response was accurate. And if I again go back to the environment, I should hopefully see a new workspace created. Awesome. After that, let us, let us create uh, a hierarchy filter. What that would do for us using basically the description of what we want the API to contain. So I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. I'm going to filter that specific workspace to only contain data for uh, that specific customer. So again, I'm going to be using APIs for that. 
we can automate that process any way we want to. And once we are done with that, and once we, again, get the 204 response, which is a great success for us, we can go back into the environment and check our results. For that, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of an idea of what the workspaces contain. So we have this admin workspace, which should contain some sample e-commerce analytics data. So you see uh, individual components like KPIs, uh, individual reports. We have some revenue trends, sales trends, and so on and so on. What we hoped to achieve using those APIs and filtering the data is, first of all, applying the workspace hierarchy, meaning that the child workspace, the customer A workspace, should now contain the same layout that we created in the admin section. So let's check that. Awesome. So it does that. But the more importantly, it also contains only customer-specific data. So linking this back to what we did uh, using these APIs and applying those filters that we did using those APIs, we basically created a separate environment, which is going to be um, linked to this, to this parent or master workspace, if you will. And by applying those workspace hierarchies, we're linking this and also filtering the data for the end client. So that would be an example, an additional example of what we can do with the APIs. I'm going to set my environment back to the default and go back to the examples. So assuming that, of course, I don't want to be doing that every time a new client comes on board, uh, I have an, ad an additional example using declarative APIs, which is a concept of basically importing everything that we created in the analytics and basically rewriting everything that we did that we had there previously. So what I'm going to be doing here is using that uh, to actually create more than one workspace and apply the hierarchies as we go, basically linking the previously created two steps together into one. So doing that. Awesome. Again, we got a we got a good, great success response, which means that if I go back and refresh my environment uh, using the APIs, uh, you would see that not only did I change the change the environment, but I actually created more workspaces, and I applied that same filtering that I showed you in the previous step uh, to multiple other customers, uh, multiple other clients, and multiple other child workspaces. So in that regard, uh, you can all already kind of envision how that can scale. Uh, that works for tens, that works for hundreds, that works for thousands of workspaces. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the APIs are the main stars of the show here, but um, using the concept of analytics as a code and applying those workspace data filters, we're essentially arriving to a point where we are creating a multi-tenant analytics just by calling the APIs. All right, so continuing on, a uh, few more examples uh, of potentially provisioning a new user in. So uh, of course, you want someone to actually be able to see uh, to see the analytics once you create it, right? So uh, what we are going to be doing now is provisioning a certain person uh, or a certain client or a certain, let's say, end user to the environment that we created. So right now to a workspace, which is going to have the ID of customer A, what we are doing is basically uh, provisioning a specific user to that environment. Again, can be done with the APIs. So any way that you can see uh, that working for you, any way that you're going to configure it as a developer, uh, as someone that is going to be responsible for the orchestration, you're going to be able to do that. So what this is, did for us is uh, applied user permissions. Which means, uh, and to kind of demonstrate that, I would have to log out of this environment where I'm now the admin. And I'm going to, again, log in. Ah, sorry, that should work. So I'm going to log in uh, into the environment as that specific tenant that got provisioned, right? So first of all, I'm only supposed to see a customer A workspace, which, which is accurate. Going into there, I'm going to have the access to the data of the entire workspace. So again, using the APIs, I basically provisioned the end user of the analytics into the same environment, only gave them access to a specific workspace, and they are now able to see the analytics that is supposed to be seen by them and utilize all those capabilities that good data provides out of the box, like filtering, drilling, 
and stuff like that. To go a little bit further, uh, we recently introduced uh, an additional feature, which is called uh, user data filters. Uh, with that, you can actually limit the scope of what the end user is supposed to be seeing within the workspace itself. So if you want to have a customer workspace and then individual people within that workspace are supposed to be seeing different things, what you can do is apply user data permissions or user data filters. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to basically say that this specific tenant, as you can again see, this is a simple example, but I would like to, even though it is simple, I would like to explain a little bit further. I have this ID of the user that I provisioned. I'm basically using this uh, metric uh, definition of what the user is supposed to be seeing. And then uh, just by calling the API again, which like I said, and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm repeating myself, but that can be automatized. Uh, I'm going to be using this API to make sure that that specific user is going to see only the data defined by this metric. So I'm going to do that. Again, got a, got a green light here. So uh, before I refresh it, I should probably see uh, Canada and United States for the, this particular person. You also see that the numbers are 120K for net sales, 104 orders, and so on and so on. So if I refresh the environment now, the numbers changed. And the numbers changed specifically because I basically filtered out the data only to contain everything related to Canada. So again, using those APIs, I applied uh, a specific permission for a specific user. All right, so let's get down to the customization of the environment. Uh, first of all, good data offers out of the box some ways to define the teaming uh, using sim simple CSS codes and stuff like that. Uh, so we can now go in and look at all the defined teams that good data offers. So similarly to when we were using this get a metric definition, we're now uh, using the APIs to get an understanding of all the teams that can be used within the good data environment that I have created and that I'm using. You see all of them now defined as a code. Uh, they all come with their individual IDs. So what I can do is basically utilize those IDs that are coming from, uh, from the response and I can change the theming for individual workspaces if I want to. So I want to customize it. I want to make sure that my end clients are going to get the customized, customized experience that they are requiring. All right. So uh, again, calling an API, made sure that the ID is filled. Uh, and this basically means that to a workspace, uh, you can see here that I'm basically applying a certain endpoint which means that I'm looking at the URL of the application that I'm using, but I'm also looking at an ID of a specific workspace. So I'm assigning that theming specifically to just one workspace only. What that means is, again, going back to this environment, if I refresh it, I changed it to a dark mode in this instance using the APIs. Similar to that, I can go ahead and change a logo. So in terms of white labeling, we have you covered as well. So the environment now, instead of just containing the, uh, the custom theming, it actually changed its uh, logo as well, which means that it, it doesn't resemble anything related to good data, which, will, which is essentially a really useful feature when it comes to embedding the analytics, if you will. We can change the localization, of course. So in this specific example, I'm going to change a couple of those bits and pieces related to good data to French. Again, something that can be easily configurable because the API first approach allows you as the end user or your developer team to make sure that they are going to define it in a way that is going to be useful for your end products, whether it's going to be a custom button, whether it's going to be something that they're going to create to make the experience good. We're going to give you that flexibility to define it using the APIs. So in this scenario, change the locale to French, which means that at least like some of the main components of good data, you already see that the loading screens and so on and so on are translated to French. We're going to be looking potentially, if we're going to have some time, we're going to be looking into how sophisticated the translation can be when uh, the APIs are combined with other tools like Python SDK and so on.
All right, so we, we have the main part of the demonstration covered. Uh, I just wanted to briefly capitalize on the things that I kind of hinted towards too. So of course, the APIs are the foundation uh, on top of which you can build all, all sorts of things, which means that whether it's going to be custom component like custom PDF, PDF export button or whether it's going to be a custom visualization uh, using some of the components that we have developed as well, uh, whether it's going to be alternation of the custom behavior, uh, out of the box behavior that good data provides, uh, you can do so using the combination of the APIs and other tools at our disposal, which I'm going to tackle as well. And of course, if you're going to customize the solution all the way to the limit, meaning you're going to create your own analytical application, embed it, and utilize your own um, a kind of front end Im image uh, imaginations. Uh, you can do so as well using the combination of the tools at your disposal where the APIs actually play a massive amount of work. The additional tooling that I'm talking about is mainly linked to uh, Python SDK, Good Data Pandas, uh, Good Data DBT plugin, which is going to be used for or very useful for transformations and making sure that like the semantic layer of good data and your data warehouse are communicating uh, accordingly. And the React SDK, which is a really useful tool for embedding the analytics into your application. So all of those are uh, basically available. And with the interaction of the APIs, and basically some of them are uh, compiled of those API calls, uh, you're going to be capable of achieving pretty much anything that you want. I'm going to basically give you a little bit of a hint of how that can work. So I'm sure that you saw the localization options that we showed out of the box using just that simple API. So you saw that some of the components of uh, good data were essentially translated to French, but not all of them. So what that meant is that the environment itself uh, got translated with some bits and pieces. Uh, on the other hand, in an ideal scenario, you would expect that a customer uh, probably wants to see even the metadata like net sales descriptions, uh, and other bits and pieces uh, translated to the other languages as well. Meaning that even in the analyze section, if you would allow the end users to interact with their own uh, analytical designer and create their own uh, reports and dashboards, you would probably like them to see the, the components of the analytics to be translated as well. So for those instances, because the good data offers those tools like Python SDK, you can actually customize the solution in a way that is going to make sense for you and your customers as well. So I'm going to kind of give you a little bit deeper understanding or like deeper example of how the localization can actually work for you. I have a custom Python script uh, for localization here. Uh, not here, uh, I have it here. So in this example, I'm basically using a Python and I'm using some translator services from third-party applications. And uh, in terms of the in terms of the definition of what has to be happening right now, I have it set up in a way that I basically just need to define which languages are supposed to be used and into which languages I want the uh, the environment to be translated. So for my scenario or for my for my example, I'm going to be translating everything to Chinese, quite simply. So just by running this Python application, uh, basically all I have to do is run this run this uh, test translate Python script. So we're getting a little bit deep here, but this is just a brief kind of uh, vision setup of what, what can be done uh, using this API first, analytics as a code, and other components of uh, good data linked together and the flexibility that it gives you. So if we go back to the environment that we have there, I'm assuming that as, if I did everything correctly, and I actually have to log in again as the as the uh, admin user to see that workspace. Okay, so I would assume that I by running that script, I actually created a new workspace, which is going to be translated to Chinese. And not only where uh, the localization options uh, led us in the past, meaning that the bits and pieces that we hoped were going to be translated, uh, out of the box, but we're actually translating all the metadata bits and pieces 
all the attributes that can be then used by the end users so that they can interact uh, with the analytics the way that they are envisioning. All right, thank you. So that was a little glimpse of what the API first approach analytics as a code and Python SDK can do for you when it comes to the flexibility, uh, when it comes to the interaction and orchestration of everything related to the analytics as well. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the demonstration. I'm guessing that in the future sessions, we're going to get a little bit deeper into what Python SDK can do for you and what other ways are there to make sure that you're going to uh, achieve what you want uh, with the analytics solution that you're looking for. Uh, so to summarize what we heard today, uh, in the essence, uh, the APIs are a simple way for two systems or multiple other systems to communicate with each other. They are also more flexible as opposed to proprietary tooling that might be coming out of the box from certain uh, from certain vendors or certain applications. So they offer your developer team to define the flexibility and uh, make sure that the application is doing exactly what you want it to. Uh, they allow easy connectivity. So like you saw uh, already in this demonstration, the connection within between uh, Python, React, and JavaScript and other, um, other components are pretty much uh, seamless. And we also believe that, and as you saw today, we, we hopefully confirmed that the API first approach is applicable to building the analytical applications as well. So uh, as opposed to making, as opposed to utilizing the uh, proprietary tooling, the APIs could be useful for making sure that you're going to automate things around the analytics as well. Data engineers, hopefully that th this is something that is going to resonate with you. Uh, we're thinking that in terms of in terms of uh, utilizing APIs, you already have some success or you had some success using that tooling at your disposal in the past. So we think that extending it to uh, both analytics as code or front end or, or building front end applications using the analytical components uh, is a natural win. So thank you for your attention and hoping to see you soon.